<clears throat> so we reviewed what an inverse was. Okay, so I take something from the range and mapped it back to a from the end of, end of the range. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Off the top of my head, I don't know which question, what the function is. Um, so there's some equation that they give you, and you don't know what it is. Yeah. Okay. So after ten years, what you'll do, whatever that function is, you'll just plug in ten for that, probably. Okay. Do you do you remember what the function was? Oh, oh, is this one of those exponential growth ones? Yeah. Okay, what is it, double every year or something? No, like double every seven years. Oh. Okay. Um, something like this. Starts off as 55, and then every seven years doubles. So you yeah. divide the total years by seven to figure out how many times it's doubled. And then you take two to that power. So it's not to give away part A of the question, probably, but and then when you figure out that function, there you go. Plug in ten. That should tell you. That should tell you that sort of thing. Does that make sense? This division by seven is what usually gets people. You need to group those seven years together somehow. So you divide by seven to say every seven it's gonna delta. You plug in seven, you get two to the first, so fifty-five times two. You plug in fourteen. You get two to the second, so it's doubled twice. Okay. All right, we're giving away too many answers for the rest of the day. So every every sentence from now on can be a question. Are we ready to move on? This is hard. It's hard, right? So we're going to continue on then uh, with the inverses real briefly. We'll talk about, um, let's see, right at the end I gave an example of how to find an inverse function with that algorithm. Uh, so maybe we'll start with something like that. Um, howdy, come on in, come on in. So let me grab another example from the end of the section and we'll find its inverse real briefly just to get the wheels turning. Kind of looks nasty, but I picked one that wasn't so simple so that we could actually see the algorithm that works. So if you remember, a function is a set of rules, a set of operations, a set of things to do. To find the inverse, we need to use the exact opposite ordering of the things we did, and we need to do the inverses to the things we did. So things like third roots, instead we're going to use third powers. And things like fifth powers, we're going to use fifth roots to undo. Instead of addition, we'll use subtraction. Instead of multiplication, we'll use division. So we're going to use those inverse operations in the exact opposite order that we did, that we do here. So the way to do that is to swap the x and the y. Which again, I said last time makes good sense because with inverses, we're switching domain and range. Our inputs are now elements of our range, and we're going to re return out something from our domain. Okay, so that's how you can kind of remember that, the swapping part. And from there, it's solving. You solve now for y. Um, and this process will give you the exact inverse uh, and uh, swap order of all of the operations. So we see a fifth root, we do its inverse, which is a fifth power, so we do its inverse, the fifth root. So that's the fifth root of x on the left. OK, 
this comes from that that law where you do the same thing to both sides. On the left, the power distributes over, and on the right, we have an exponential essentially raised to another power, which means we multiply the powers. One fifth times five is exactly one, so we drop it. Next, we'll instead of adding two, we'll subtract the two. And then instead of taking the third root, we'll raise both sides to the third power. And that will cancel out the third root and introduce a third power on the other side. So this new y value will be defined as the inverse. So if this is our original function, f of x equals y, and the rule for that is this, then f inverse is just equal to this end result. Fifth root of x minus 2 raised to the third power. And we saw something called the cancellation property last time that says if you do have inverses, and they're both functions, then you can do this sort of thing. And every time, no matter whether you get, uh, no matter whether, whether you do the inverse first or the uh, original function first, you should get just the input back out. We can verify any time we try to find an inverse, we can verify that we have in fact found it by doing these compositions. So this is like a check your work moment where here's our original function, here's our inverse function. We can plug one into the other and verify that we just get our input out. So maybe I'll example that one time. We're going to take this, we're going to plug that in for this x. So here we go. This is f of f inverse of x. So 2 plus the third root of x. But instead of putting x, I'm going to put the whole f inverse function. Okay, So the whole thing goes in place of the x. So now I'll write the whole formula for that. That's the fifth root of x minus 2 raised to the third power. Okay. And I forgot the fifth power here on the original function. Everyone with me so far? Now it's just a simplifying process. The third root of something cubed. Well, that's nice. Those just cancel out. 2 plus the fifth root of x minus 2 raised to the fifth power. Right, the third root cancels the third power, so this is just what it is. No power. 2 minus 2 is nothing. This is just the fifth root of x raised to the fifth power, and that's x. So we have verified this equals x, which gives us hope that we did, in fact, correctly find the inverse. Do we know that it's the inverse yet? Well, to really verify it, we should check this, right? Check the other ordering. Take f inverse of f and verify we get x out, but I'm uh, pretty sure this is going to work out. So we'll say for now, verify. <laughs> okay. Okay. So that's, again, how you find an inverse given a rule. And uh, how you verify that you've got the inverse once you think you found it. Okay. Can I erase? There's another way of finding an inverse if you don't have the rule, but instead have the function. Uh, the function's graph, rather. So 
let's say I give you a graph. You can verify this is a function by using the vertical line test. So we'll call this f. How can you find the function, or hopefully the function, of, um, or the graph rather, is it certain? How can you find the graph of its inverse? Well, it has to do with this little line right here. You find y equals x. The key idea for a function and its inverse is that the function takes something from the domain to the range, and an inverse takes range item back to the domain, and we're just swapping the two. So there's this key idea about this line, where if you take any x, y coordinate for a value on the function, swapping them has the exact same effect as reflecting about this line. Now this is the x, that should be the same length as that. And this is the y, that should be the exact same value as this. So if you have any graph of a function, you can always find the graph of its inverse by simply just taking points and reflecting them about this line y equals x. If you have a piece of, uh, maybe, you ha maybe you've done this before, maybe you haven't, but back in like, maybe middle school and high school, we had these, we had these like plastic plexiglass things. Um, they looked kind of like this. They were transparent. And what you could do with them was you could put this line, you know, put, essentially this forms a line here. If you have a picture of something over here, say like, a smiley face, and you wanted to reflect it on the other side, you would put this piece of plastic on the piece of paper, and you'd put this line where you wanted to reflect over. And then when you look through this, you can see the reflection of what you want to draw on the paper, right? So like you're looking through here, and you can see the reflection here of what you should draw, and so you draw that on the paper behind the glass. You remember, have you ever, does anyone know what I'm talking about? Hmm. Imagine you've got a, you know, just a, a mirror, right? And you can reach behind the mirror and draw on a piece of paper. It's like you're looking at it, you see yourself in the mirror. This is what my head looks like. And, uh, and so you're looking at the mirror, you see your face, but you can reach behind the mirror and you can see behind the mirror slightly so that you can see your hand. And so you can draw behind the mirror on the paper that's there, and so you can draw the exact reflection. That's the idea. Yeah, just with something that, you know. Okay. No, but as the years go on, maybe fewer and fewer, fewer and fewer people will have this recollection of what that is, because we can use that exact same tool to make nice drawings of inverse functions. This will be the inverse. It's just a reflection of that graph across the line y equals x. Okay. Does it make sense why it's a reflection? Again, it's just because we're swapping the x and the y coordinates, domain and range. Okay, so now. Here. Now we get into sort of like the, the section that we had before, which was the catalog of functions. You'll remember I misspelled that. Um, catalog of functions, but now we're going to look we're through all of those things, and we're going to create a catalog of inverses. Okay. So for everything that we've studied so far, there's essentially... Um, for many of them, there's essentially a nice inverse that we should learn, that we should know, and uh, be able to work with. Okay. The first one, I think, is logarithms. Yeah. 
So we all know exponential functions. We all know logarithms. It just so happens that exponentials and logarithms are exact inverses of one another. And we know this equivalent expression, I think I wrote it before. Uh, I used different letters in the book each time, so a b to the y equals x. An exponential has a base, some positive number, uh, that's not 1, some power y, and some end result x. And the logarithm has some base b, which is subscripted, some argument x, and some output y. And these are equivalent expressions, meaning if this is true, then so is this. Okay, they're not equivalent in that they're exactly the same thing. Logarithms are not exponentials. Exponentials are not logarithms. They're inverses of each other. But they're equivalent in the sense that if I have a pair, x and y, that make this true, then the same pair will make this statement true. Built up pressure down there. So how do we use this in application? So let me give you a nice little example. Uh, I've already given you some numerical examples. We can easily compute certain numerical laws like this. We just treat them like uh, composition of a function with its inverse, and then we know exactly what we're going to get. If I try to think of the input as a logarithm, or sorry, as an exponential with this base, what would it be? 81 is 3 to what power? 3 times 3 is 9, times 3 is 27, times 3 is, is 1. 4 or 3 is multiplied together. Because these are inverses, they have the, the cancellation property. Here's our input, essentially, to the problem that we've got here. If our function is the logarithm base 3 of x, and our inverse is 3 to the x, then we can use the cancellation property f of f inverse of 4 is just 4 to give us that result. Real quick. Just four. Okay, maybe something that's not so easy next with the logarithm. Ooh. Okay, another example. It's not going to have a nice, easy solution like the previous one, but we can use these inverse functions to help us solve expressions like this. So let's say there's some number, 2x plus 4, that when you take the natural log of it, you get 3. Okay? So the question is, what is the original x that gives us that power of e? We're going to use inverses. So how can we get this out of the natural log, well, we use the, exp the natural exponential as a base, and we take this whole left side as the power of that exponential, and on the right side, we do the same thing. The reason we do that is because these are inverses of each other. So when you take an inverse function, you plug it into your original function, you get out what you originally plugged in, which is 2x plus 4. So the cancellation says that e and that natural log just cancel out. Question? Yes. Where did you get those points from? Did I, did I, you know, uh, good question. 
it was right here. And so it was probably like on the forefront of my mind. That's a mistake. Thanks for keeping me honest. Okay, I think, I think it's good now. Okay, so now we know, uh, we know how to solve this. This is just some number. So we can just solve it. Subtract four, divide by two. So x is e to the third minus this four divided by two. That is the x, whatever its value is. That is the x, which guarantees that the natural log of 2x plus 4 is 3. Okay. We found it by using the inverse to the natural log, which is the natural exponential. Questions about log and inverses? If not, I'm going to throw a couple properties of logs at you. So because of this relationship right here, um, that the logarithms are equivalent to some exponential, we can come up with some really nice rules for logarithms. Um, so log of any base, this applies for any base at all. If you have log of a product, that's exactly the same as a sum of logs. Okay, if you think about that just a little bit, you can easily explain it from those power properties that we talked about before uh, and this equivalent expression. Translate that into an exponential and you'll essentially see that it's just exponential power sum rules. The next one is for any log, any base, you take a quotient inside. That is equivalent to a difference of logs. And the last little property, I think, was there three or was there just two? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. The next little property is a neat little trick. Let's say you have a logarithm, any log, any base, and inside the argument, there's a power. Okay, so like it could be like like this, for example. 3 to the 4th. We've got the power 4 in there. This is exactly the same as taking the power and multiplying it by the logarithm of the argument without the power. It's 1, 2, 3 little rules. 1 for products inside logarithms, 1 for quotients inside logs, and one for exponentials inside logs. Uh, these are nice little rules to help you simplify and solve problems such as this. And then, yeah, your book gives a nice little example of, of something like that, so I'll run through that as well. I'm going to erase the left side if that's okay. as a uh, bit of review, I said this last time. What does LG stand for? What base? Not 10. Not E. 2. LN is log base E. LOG with nothing is log base 10. LG is base 2. So now I'm going to stop right up that way so that no one's confused for the rest of the lecture. Just like this is a quick reminder. 
Okay, so log base 2 of 80 minus log base 2 of 5. We can use these rules to maybe make this a little easier. It's because nobody knows what power of 2, 5 is, and nobody knows what power of 2, 80 is, because they're not whole values, right? Okay, so we can use this and rule 2 here to make one logarithm. It's going to be the log base 2 of 80 divided by 5. And this is, 80 over 5 is, 16. And we know that's a power of 2. 2, 4, 8, 16. From here, we see we've got a base 2 logarithm of a base 2 exponential composed together. So the result is just going to be the power. That's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is the definition of the log. What is the power of this base that gives you this result? Well, it's, it's obviously the power of that base, so 4. Okay. So something intractable at first, something that's difficult to solve at first because you don't know perfect powers of 2 uh, equaling 80 or 5. There are no perfect whole powers of 2. But then you rewrite it, and it's, it's you know, 4. Questions on that? Yes? This is LG, usually. Is that what we're talking about? Oh, oh, 16. 16, LG. Log 2 pounds. No, nope. no. Nope. Log 2, 16. Yep. Yeah, I uh, I call my handwriting chicken scratch. So if you have a difficult time reading it, sorry. But the, yeah, thank you. Um, funny story. I was in an algebra exam a long time ago. I couldn't read my own handwriting. That did not end up well. fast, too slow today. We just want a longer Labor Day weekend so far today. Okay. And I got like nothing else. There's, there's more stuff, but it's not as exciting as Labor Day weekend. Okay, I did that, did that, we did that, we did that, we did that. Okay, so Your book is a nice way to change bases. Um, but it does so only to natural logs. And um, so I'll write down what your book says, but I'll give you the more generic statement. So let's say, oh, I don't know, there's a problem that gives you a, a, a logarithm in a base that you're unfamiliar with or in a base that you don't like to work with. Uh, is there any way you can, you know, say, take like a log base B of something and rewrite it in another base? Equivalently, we're, we're asking an exponential problem. You know, can we change the base of an exponential problem? The answer is yes, you can do that sort of thing, but you need to sort of adjust sort of multipliers and other things. Um, and so there's a nice formula for it. Your book says, here you go, you can throw it into the natural log by performing this, quotient. So you take the natural log of the input to your original log, and you divide it by the natural log of your old base. And this will allow you to translate between a base B into natural log, or from natural log back into a different base of your choosing. 
And sometimes this is also useful in solving, but there's a more general statement of it. Um, you know, maybe I'm not even going to get into it. I'm, I'm not even going to get into it. There's a more general statement. We'll uh, we'll stop here though. Check done. We've got too much to get through, and that's sufficient for now. So uh, a nice clear-cut example would just be, you know, take the log base oh, I don't know, three of some input, and maybe that input includes like e to the x. So like I, you know, for any value of x, it's not necessarily easy to see what the value of that is. But if you re re rewrite this in terms of natural logs, this is the natural log of the input, e to the x, what's that? What's the natural log of e to the x? Just x. We take a function and compose it with its inverse, and we get just x back, cancellation log. And then we're going to divide it by the natural log of our old base, natural log of 3. That's just a number. So if you ever want to compute log base 3 of some power of e, you might as well just compute that power divided by natural log 3. You're going to, you're going to get the same value. The benefit here is you don't have to exponentiate anything. You find the natural log of 3 one time, and then for any input of x, you just have your result, x divided by that number. Um, this is why old math books used to have log tables in the back. You can flip all the way to the back, and they'll have approximations of logs out to like you know 16 decimal places for pages because computing this you know that changes for every single power of x uh, but this natural log of 3 never changes okay. all right moving right along I've got a Q three inches tall, three inches deep, and three inches wide. In the very center of this cube is a one inch by one inch cube. How many cuts does it take to remove that cube from the middle? After you cut the cube, which is made out of cheese, presumably, so you can eat it after, after you cut the cube, you're allowed to take the pieces and rearrange them and then cut them again. Okay, so you can rearrange as much as you want. You can cut multiple pieces with one cut. How many cuts does it take to get the middle cube out? I'm looking at people and they're like, they're looking and they remember what cut X it was. Like, gotcha. I can do it in 20 cuts, so that's just because I want to share cheese with more people. How many cuts do you do? One. One cut. You can get that cube out. Yeah. It's it's like a whole block of cheese from the beginning. Yeah. So like. Yeah, so how do you get the cube out? Use your fingers. That's very okay. <laughs> <laughs> But then it's maybe not a cube anymore, right? Well, I think if you want the cube, then... It has to be a cube. I'm a math teacher. Like, it has to be a cube. Then you can cut four times. Four times. Four times. Just four? Yeah. If you, like, if you knew how, like, far down it was, you could cut it, like, across the top, across the side, and across the back. One. Side. Yeah. Two. Then at the bottom. Uh, what about this back face? It's still attached to the back portion. Well, really? see, like, because since you cut it like that, you can just, like, go to the top and just, you know what I mean? Like, the eyes, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, that's your homework. 
The question is, what's the smallest number of cuts? And it has to do with an invariant, some aspect of the cube that never changes. OK. So now we're going to talk about some inverses of trig functions. Um, We're going to talk about trig functions. We'll start with sine of x. We'll move on to cosine of x, and then we're going to get into tangent as well, I believe. Um, the secant, cosecant, and cotangent are, we're also going to talk about those. Um, so this is where uh, I think most people still have issues with trig functions, um, even maybe, definitely after the pretest, and maybe even after last time's, a um, uh, couple times the review of trig functions. So real quick, as something on the unit circle, tell your neighbor what is sine of x. And tell your neighbor, so what is this? And tell your neighbor, what does x represent? Two things. What is this and what does x represent? Go ahead. Right triangle trig. Ooh. Oh, he's missing it. It didn't pop up. No, that's fine. That's fine. If we if we picture it that way, that's okay. So in that case, what is what is x represent? An angle. Very good. So let's say this is the angle x. This is a right angle. The sine of this angle is equal to the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse side. Those are lengths of the triangle. That's one way to picture it. Uh, in terms of unit circle, what is sine of x? Um, zero comma zero comma y. One. One. Like oh, it's sometimes. Like y, is that the coordinate? No. Sometimes it's the what coordinate? Y coordinate. Yes. Sine of x is the y coordinate on the unit circle. So you take a point on the unit circle anywhere, anywhere, any point. So I've commonly drawn that one, but. We'll say that's my point now. This has some pairing that describes its location on the board. This is always the sign. The y coordinate is always the sign. The sign of what? So what does the x represent? Theta, the angle. Yep. So it's the angle formed from the x-axis positive side, counterclockwise to that edge. 
Okay, so this is my angle. Sine of that angle is the y coordinate of the point on the unit circle that that angle ends at. I know it's a little confusing. I'll put an x there. What is cosine of x? It's the x coordinate. And the angle is still the same. Okay? And what is tangent? Fred. Close. That is the cotangent. Y divided by the x. Yes. Okay, so this is the sine of the angle divided by the cosine of the angle. This is the cosine of the angle divided by the sine of the angle. In terms of triangles, tangent and cosine are also defined in terms of sides. Cosine is the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse side length. Uh, I'll give you a concrete numerical example here. Three, four, we make a Pythagorean triple. We pick one number, we square it, we pick another number, we square it, add them together, take the square root. And that's the length of the hypotenuse. In this case, 3, 4, and 5 gives just 5. This is a nice right triangle. Uh, so this is our angle. Sine of x is just equal to 4 divided by 5. 4 fifths. Cosine of the angle is equal to the adjacent side length divided by the hypotenuse. Tangent is equal to sine divided by cosine. So if we write that out, it's 4 fifths divided by 3 fifths, which would cancel out to 4 over 3, giving us just the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. Cap course means right triangle, great definition. Okay, that's just what they are. So it's just a bit of a review for us. We're going to now start talking about inverse functions. So I always, you know, I always find this helpful to think about um, <coughs> the interpretation of the inputs. Trig functions, I always like to cast them in this angle to ratio idea, in this light. Trig functions take angles. Right? That's the domain. And they map them over to ratios. Or we can say they map them over to coordinates. That's what a trig function does. Okay? I mean, really, they don't have to be angles. Any real number we can plug in, right? But if I picture them as an angle, then it reminds me that we're talking about a ratio on a triangle, or we're reminding myself of a coordinate on the inner circle. And sometimes that helps keep straight when you start talking about the inverse trig functions. It helps us keep straight, you know, what, which one's doing what. Can you plug in an angle to an inverse trig function? Sometimes, but not always. Can you plug in any coordinate on the you know unit square? Yeah, you can. So like when you when you cast these in the, these respective lights, it helps you keep straight the domains of these things, which is the crux of what we're going to get at next. Okay. So here we go. First and easiest question. Here's the graph of sine of x. If we start at an angle equal to zero, 
So we're right here. What is the y coordinate at that point when the angle is zero? Zero. Uh, right. This coordinate pair is one comma zero. What's the y coordinate? Zero. So at an angle of zero, sine gives a value of zero. Right? Okay. Sine gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it reaches this angle here, which in radians is pi over two. And that value is 1. So we go up to a value of 1 at pi over 2. After pi, we keep going a little bit more. We're all the way over here. And we're back down to a y coordinate of 0. So the graph so far looks something like this. And then it's just going to do the exact same thing, but on underneath the axis here. This is 3 pi over 2. This is 2 pi. Once we've gone all the way around the, uh, the circle, we repeat. We just keep going in this repetitive nature. Backwards, it keeps repeating. This gets repeated over and over and over again. So we have this. This is negative pi over 2. This is negative pi. This is negative 3 pi over 2. This is negative 2 pi. Okay, the easiest question of the day. This is review so far. Is this a function? Yes, how do you know? Vertical line test. Vertical line test, OK. It has an inverse. Is its inverse a function? No. Why not? Okay, but what does that mean? It doesn't pass the word. Why not? She doesn't know. I told her I wouldn't ask her any questions. I just don't trust her. Anyone else? <clears throat> what does the horizontal line test tell you? Um, the points can't pass through any like x values. You can't be like what x values. Right. Okay. So if I Pick a Y, horizontal line, there's one, there's two, <coughs> keep going, there's a third one here, there's a fourth one, there's a fifth one, there's more, there's an infinite number of them, right? If the inverse of this has, it is a function, then that means that this Range value can only be mapped to one thing in the domain, but it's not. And the horizontal line test shows us all of those things that it's mapped to. This y value gets sent to, so y is sent to the list, x1, x2, x3, that infinite list, right? So the inverse is not a function. I could graph cosine as well up here, and you would see pretty much the exact same graph, just shift it over a little bit. It has an inverse. Is its inverse a function? No. It's the same graph, but it's shifted a little bit left. So we do the horizontal line test. We get all these things out for one of these y values. Inverse of cosine is not a function. Tangent. Tangent. Doesn't look like sine and cosine. Tangent. Looks a bit different. And you'll see right away it's a function. Explain these dotted lines in just a second. Maybe I don't need to. Tangent repetitively, repetitively 
I always have to say that word multiple times, right? Uh, plots this exact same sort of spiral thing. So as, as it is, it's a function. It passes the vertical line test. But if you do a horizontal line, you get all of these possible outputs for any given height. So the inverse is not a function. But it's really helpful to be able to talk about sines and sine inverses and cosines and cosine inverses. Okay, in particular, uh, think about triangulation problems. Okay, so cars nowadays, you know about this. There's a view, rear view camera, of course, but prior to rear view cameras, there were these motion sensors on the back that sent out waves, okay? Um, and they would collide with things, and then they would bounce back, kind of like echolocation with the back. Um, could you determine where the object is based on the timing data and based on the separation distance of the sensors? Absolutely, you could. Okay, well, right there we're talking about determining angles from timing data. These things take in angles. They don't give angles back. The inverse functions give angles back. So triangulation problems of knowing, hey, there's something right here based on you know, these angles, those are inverse problems. So it's really helpful to be able to have a function instead of something that returns a giant list of possibilities. Okay? So there's a little bit of, uh, I don't know what to call it, a little bit of uh, jimmying. You know, when you put a key in the lock and it doesn't quite open, so you shake it a little bit. Okay. And then it works. There's a little bit of work that we do in order to turn these things into functions. And it has to do with restrictions. Sometimes. A function is restricted to certain parts of its domain. Okay, so this is just a restriction, restricted. What this means is only values in some smaller part of D are allowed. See, mathematically, this can arise as like uh, for example, function composition, we, we take one function, we compose it with another, and suddenly we need to restrict our first function so that we only get values that are in the possible domain of the next function down the line. We can restrict ourselves to only using a smaller part of our original domain. And this is an absolute necessity here in defining the inverse function for sine and cosine and tangent. But this is also something that is of necessity when you're talking about you know, your, your jobs. So there's mathematical functions that tell you all sorts of things about all sorts of you know, possible inputs. But oftentimes you're really only interested or possibly you only want users, for example, in computers, to input certain things. So you force them to give you certain values. You know, when I say, give me a number between one and 10, I hope you don't say 20, right? Or, or you know, pi to the pi's power. Um, I restrict you to that one to ten. Maybe I don't need to believe in that point. So the sine and cosine, there's a sort of standard choice. Sine again looks like this fancy wave. It goes over and over and over again. This is the origin. We want to pick a part of that that has an inverse function. So we want to pick a piece of this where when you do the horizontal line test, it passes. The domain is the whole real number line, but the standard restriction is to take an angle from here to here only. That's the standard restriction. 
that I, I graphed was almost endless. This is a negative sine of x. I saw that look. I knew that you knew that look. It doesn't change the restriction, but it does change the graph argument. Standard restriction is to only allow inputs from sine within negative pi over 2, pi over 2. And what this does is this gives us a small little branch of the sine function. It says we're only going to keep this part. Many calculators just do this. When you plug in, you know, uh, the inverse function for sine, it only gives you angles out that are between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. It doesn't give you anything bigger than pi over 2. Okay? Yeah, question? Okay. Yeah, you don't need to ask that. That's fine. We're all adults in here. We know what we have to yell. When you got to go, you just go. Okay, all right. I have to ask enough at home. Do we need to go to the bathroom? We're about to get in the car. <laughs> you know, like parenting. Man, things. So, things we never thought about when we were young, you know? Man. Are we living? Okay, so uh, back to this. When we only focus on this part of the sine function, we notice that it, it does pass the horizontal line test. We throw away everything else. Okay, and what that means is now we have an inverse function that's well defined. Okay, sine of x takes numbers between negative pi over 2, pi over 2. And it gives us values between negative 1 and 1. Sine inverse now, it's the reflection of this graph across the line y equals x. So it looks like this. I'll try my best. This point stays fixed. This point, oh, maybe it doesn't here. We need this line y equals x. We reflect it. We get something that looks like this. And we can consider these points. Negative 1 and negative pi over 2. Positive 1 and pi over 2. This one has the domain that's exactly the same as the range here. And because of the restriction on sine before, its range is not that infinite list of things that we talked about earlier. It just gives us the one value that corresponds to that specific input. From negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, no angles are repeated. Okay, so now, for example, if I ask, what is sine inverse of 1? Before, and still, we keep this in mind. Before, I would answer, well, this angle, this here, this angle, that one. Uh, the next one that's right here, all of those angles give you 1 or 5. So sine inverse of 1 is all of those angles, the entire list. But now, what do we say? It's only one angle. And it's exactly pi over 2. Just one. Is that clear? This sort of throws away the bad behavior of the sine inverse function. Questions on this?
11 minutes left. So if I can graph cosine of x the first time around, this won't take very long. Right, it's not the best graph. This should be a good idea. OK. What would you say, maybe you remember, but maybe we can just look at the graph. What would you say is like a good choice of a restriction for cosine? That would be a great restriction. If I just look here to here, 0 to pi. So that means for the graph, I'm talking about this part here. No repeated values vertically. No repeated values horizontally either. So we know that the inverse of this is going to be a function. Additionally, we didn't choose a bunch of negatives when we didn't have to. Okay, this one we kind of had to. Uh, and this one's also pretty close to being centered on zero, which is a very nice characteristic of that one. Cosine x now, when restricted to zero to pi, still has the full range, 1 down to negative 1. A domain 0 to pi, that means the cosine inverse of something. We plug in a ratio between negative 1 and 1. We get an angle out. Um, now only between 0 and pi, which is great. We don't get that constant repetition of things. So with cosine inverse defined this way and cosine restricted in that way, we have a function and its exact inverse. Which means you need to be careful with things. So I'm going to can I erase the sign and I'll give you some examples. Some things to be careful about. In particular, the cancellation property. You'd love to just say this, right? You'd just love that. But based on what we just did, is that possible? What is this angle? What should we have here instead? What's cosine of 3 pi over 2? Pi over 2, here's 2 pi over 2, this is 1 pi over 2, 2 pi over 2, 3 pi over 2. What's the cosine of that? We get 0. I heard somebody say. So what's the cosine inverse? 0. Well, what angle between 0 and pi has a cosine equal to 0? has the exact same x coordinate as this one. 3 pi over 2 is not in 0 to pi. It's too big. It's bigger than pi. It's outside that range. Pi over 2. Pi over 2 is right in the middle, halfway through, and it has the same the same Cancellation laws, remember, only apply for when domains and ranges match up. So you can use them when your angle is within you know, the possible range that you're working with. But when you're not, and you're working with restricted functions, remember that things are sort of brought back in. Things outside of 0 and pi are essentially folded back into 0 to pi because of the repetition. That means whenever you answer an inverse problem, you only give values between 0 and pi for cosine, between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 for sine. OK? I know, that's, I know these are confusing. So are there any questions about that sort of idea?
Should I throw more at you? You okay? You're okay, I guess. Okay. 1249. Okay, tangent is the easiest one to show the restriction for, um, and it's just because of the way that the graph is. When you graph tangent, it's got this really nice repetitive nature to it. It's a bunch of these things which have asymptotes here. That means this line, this uh, curve gets closer and closer and closer to that dotted line. Okay, as you go you know, up higher and higher, they just get closer and closer, but it, it doesn't actually cross that at infinity, it sort of reaches it. And then it restarts back down here, and comes back up, and then goes, and then just restarts. A good choice of tangent restriction would be to just take that piece. Take, not this one, not the ones that are repeated over here, we'll just take this whole branch of it. And that's going to be the restriction for us. There's all these other ones to choose from, but this one's nice and centered, and it goes from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, which is just like our sine value. So tangent, I'll give you the same information about tangent. We're going to say it has a domain of negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, and a range, we know what that is, it's all real numbers. This restriction, it does in fact give us an inverse function, which has a domain equal to all real numbers. You can get anything you want in tangent inverse. And it outputs an angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. If this is too low to read, it probably is. Domain and range have just swapped for the inverse function, so you can just copy those in the reverse order. I have a question. Yes. What does the inverse of tangent look like? Good. Um, so you take this graph, right? And you think of this line like that. And you just spin it around there. So it would look something like this. This point stays the same. This point stays the same. It looks like like that. OK, good question erase the unnecessary stuff, give you a clearer picture. There we go. So there's tangent of x, and it's inverse. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's it for material. Oh, there, are, there is stuff to talk about with cosecants and secants and their inverses. Uh, how much time do we have left? Two minutes. Yeah, we can hand it. We can hand it out. Oh, all you people putting your notes away. Come on! Where's your courage? Or maybe, I don't know. Maybe that's run out. We didn't even talk about cosecants and secants. So for one minute, we'll talk about one of them. Secant of x. Remember, this is equal to the reciprocal of cosine of x. Uh, yeah, cosine of x. So I'll put the graph of cosine of x. Cosine starts at 1, comes down like this, and goes like this. What's the graph of, cos, uh, of secant look like? It's the reciprocal of these heights. So everywhere it's 1, it's going to be 1 over 1. Everywhere cosine is 1, we're going to have 1 over 1. So the secant hits this, it hits this, it hits this, and this, and this. And everywhere cosine is 0, we're going to have an asymptote. Because we'll be dividing by 0. So the secant has uh, these zeros, these sort of those lines like I had in the tangent function. Like so. And then everywhere in between, we have this really cool thing happening where we have something coming up and going down. When it's in the positive side, it's coming down first and then going up. Same thing here. Okay, 
think about that. These are numbers between 0 and 1. When you take a reciprocal of a fraction smaller than 1, you get something bigger than 1. The smaller the fraction, the bigger the reciprocal. So you get the red graph for the secant graph. Okay. What would be a good choice of an inverse restriction? What would your guess be? This one's a little trickier. Uh, maybe you remember this is 0, this is pi over 2, this is pi, this is negative pi over 2, this is negative pi. We need it to be, uh, we need to be 1 to 1 in there. Well, how about we just pick this part and this part? So we take only angles between 0 and pi, and we cut out pi over 2. Yeah? So the vertical one can't the The red graph is a graph of secant. The blue one is cosine. Maybe we can start here next. Okay. All right. Thank you for coming.